I recently appeared on Creative Living with Cheryl Borden and came up with an idea while filming a mug rug and um, my idea was to make a champagne coaster so that when the bride and groom toasts their champagne glasses are sitting on a beautiful heart and you monogram their names or use my pattern that has bride and groom on it and um, I think it makes a, a wonderful gift you can also embroider the date it, that would really personalize it so how do we do this we're going to use the Opti hoops and the design itself is relatively small so I'm going to use the smallest of the frames and set these aside Another thing you're going to want is some bridal lace on this mug rug. Oh, it's not a mug rug. It is a champagne coaster. I used a metallic lace and it has a nice uh, appearance to it. This is a more subtle appearance, which I think will actually make the embroidery stand out better. This is a high quality bridal satin and it's a very forgiving fabric to work with. And I want to get the lace to become one with the satin. To do so, I'm going to go ahead and take your lace and get it wet. Seems a little odd, doesn't it? And we, and we want to shake off some of the water, but not a lot of it. Make sure you know which side is right and which side is wrong. And on the wrong side, we're going to lay it over some sprinkles of fusible powder and this is the 007 bonding agent go ahead then and we lay the lace in there and kind of rub it around so that the adhesive bonds to the area of the lace that actually has structure to it so we if you were to take a fusible webbing and, and fuse this to the fabric every hole in the lace would have fusible webbing on it and, and if you went to iron the garment you would end up getting your iron all fused up so we go ahead now and set this aside and to protect the iron there are different pressing cloths that you can use but I really like for this particular technique to use the paper release liner from fusible webbing. The paper, once you've removed the fusible webbing, becomes a pressing cloth. So now your trash is a valuable item in your sewing arsenal. Now we take this and place it over the lace. And you see I've also lined my ironing board with the same paper release liner. And we just go ahead and press and count to about 30 and press again. Do not iron. The difference between pressing and ironing is pressing is pushing down and ironing is moving the iron around on the fabric. And when you move the iron around on the fabric, you do have the risk of making the lace uh, fold over on itself and you can get a pucker. Once you feel that it's cool to the touch, instead of just quickly pulling it off, you want to pull in uh, and kind of peel it back like a banana peel and as you reveal this what you find is that you now have a single piece of fabric that has bridal lace on top of it a one-of-a-kind fabric made just by you we're going to also do some sewing with this it's it's a really fun project because we're going to use my OctiHoop kit, we're going to use the pearls and piping foot and the, also the satin edge foot. So what I did was I took the pattern that, con that we have a link for, so be sure to go down and click on the link and it'll take you right to the pattern telling you exactly how to make this. This is a heart shape and I took it on my light box and laid the fabric with the lace and before cutting out anything and you just lay it down and trace around and I used a sharpie marker here so that you could see it doesn't really matter if you do either because as long as you cut um, right on the inside of that line then you're good and you don't have to worry about any of the ink showing after you're done so you see how we have 
the bride and the groom, and there's this odd looking uh, diagram with a little gray box around it. And what that gray area represents is the stick and rinse stabilizer. And this is a film that you print on and then embroider through and then it washes out when you're done. And in this case, we're not gonna wash it and no one will know it's in there. So we're gonna go ahead, write an X on a piece of paper and insert that in into your printer first uh, and have the X be down. And then as you print, it comes out looking like this. Then you're gonna tape the stick and rinse stabilizer into the, over the gray area. And this is it done right here. You can see here this end is not taped yet. And it's just your regular scotch tape. And if you tape on the top and the bottom, then there's no chance that that could come loose inside your printer. And I have printed hundreds of stickers. So I know that this is really safe as long as you use your inkjet printer. Then you're going to go ahead and take, and looking at the X again, take that X, put it down, insert it into the printer, and then after the paper comes out of the printer, you have now printed right onto your sticker. Have them out of order. And there you go. Then we take and peel off the sticker. But don't lose the tape you took off because it is a very helpful tool for getting the release liner off of the stick and rinse stabilizer. See how it just peeled it right off. Now you want to tape this to your light box so that you can position the design properly on the heart pattern. Or if it is daytime, you can tape the paper onto your window and then tape your fabric onto the window over the paper and it makes a, a very affordable light box. And now I'm going to talk about a little bit more about what we're using for the remainder of the project. One of the things I want to use is a universal needle and the reason we use universal needle is because the tip of the needle has a little roundedness to it so that it won't cut through the fabric that we're, what, that we're sewing with. Should you have any skip stitches, switch to the stretch needle and uh, it should solve your problems. Just to make sure that the lace doesn't become separated from the bridal fabric beneath, we're going to go around and do a straight stitch all the way around the line that we drew. So we'll go ahead and um, the satin edge foot will help you guide straight using a straight stitch. If you line up the needle on your sewing machine with the wire on the presser foot so that it's right next to it, it'll help you steer straight over the line. So we bring the needle down to see that we're in position. And once you know that you do have your needle right next to the, to the line, now we watch the front leading edge of the foot. I'm going to stitch. So don't watch the needle and it's going to be tempting. Once you have this in position, you just watch the front of the presser foot and uh, Make sure you're always looking where you're going, not where you're at. And you'll notice that I don't, I don't feel the need to lower the sewing machine needle on my corners because I can see where I'm at. The wire represents the needle position. Feel free to lower your needle on a straight stitch if you like, but on a zigzag stitch with the satin edge foot, it's better to always leave the needle up on your corners. And I'll explain that as we move along the outside of the heart. Now notice my hand positioning, and, and I say this on all of the all of my episodes, always keep your arms down as you're sewing. It's not about lifting your elbows because that causes pain across the shoulders. So see how my arms are resting and I have my hands under the fabric. So it's just a very light touch and that also reduces uh, some of the puckers that you might be experiencing. Another thing that, that you don't want to do is this. You don't want to put your hands down like this and, because then you can distort the fabric and stretch it across the bias. If you feel as though it's not feeding well, then you can uh, go into your machine settings and change the foot pressure to a lighter pressure, which I, I already have done. So see how I'm cradling the fabric from beneath? Really letting the sewing machine do the feeding for me. And keep your eye where you're going so that you don't miss the direction that you're trying to go. Lift and pull, oh no, lift and turn. 
and place the presser foot down again. I would, I, I, I have this wonderful button that raises the foot and lowers the foot for me, but I'm still getting the hang of using this wonderful new machine. And uh, it is the Crescendo by Baby Lock. Oh, I just put my hands in the wrong position. So we watch the front of the foot, don't look at the needle. Even though I invented this, I still have to say, uh, look at the knee, look at the front of the foot, look at the front of the foot. Because of all the years of sewing before I created this. There we go. Now we've gone all the way around and we know that the heart, the lace will not come off of the bridal satin. And we'll go ahead now and cut the thread with my wonderful little cutter in the machine. And we're ready to put on our invisible free motion foot. And I say that in jest because we're not going to use a foot at all. Before we go any further, we have to put stabilizer on the back of the frame. And the stabilizer we put on the back of the frame is Stick and Tear, also known as SIA. And we take and place the hoop over the roll of stabilizer. And then using a pen, you just trace all the way around. And then using scissors, cut it. Or you could place this on a rotary cutting board and use your rotary cutter, but I find that you might waste some of the stabilizer by doing that. And I take and fold the release liner to make it easier to pull it apart. And then fold down. And this is the release liner. It's, it's the only part of this that's paper. This is actually a, a polyester fabric. So you don't have to worry about your needle becoming dull by using our stick and rinse or stick and tear stabilizer. And you just go ahead and place it there and you rub it really hard and then pull. Take and stretch now and rub it. And it's best if you alternate one side and then the next. Stretch this side, then that side, and then switch it and then do that side and that side. And take and place the fabric onto the frame and think about this we're going to not be able to see the hoop as we place the fabric over it but it doesn't matter because we can't hit the frame if we're coloring over the sticker so this is one of the easiest ways of doing machine embroidery we want to make sure that the sticker is not on the frame and you can reposition this until you got it in a really comfortable location and then once it's in position, all you really have to push down on is the actual sticker itself. So, in other words, the rest of this can hang and not actually be adhered to the stabilizer at all. And now that's enough to hold it in place while we embroider. Another thing to note is that if you're using metallic thread, the odds are you will have to re-thread your machine at least once because it it is a little temperamental. Let's just be honest. It, uh, it's a beautiful thread and worth the, the uh, re-threading. So now, whoops, I have my handle dropped into the frame. I get into the proper embroidered position, which is elbows down, and then I put on my glasses so that I can see where I'm going. Using the, uh, since you, if you have the ability to lower your feed dogs, go ahead and lower them. I frequently do not, especially when I'm at a show, when I'm live, I, I leave them up a lot for those of you who can't lower your feed dogs. If you can lower them, by all means do so, and I will now because it's easier on filming if they are down. If you are using a machine that requires you bring the bobbin thread up, go ahead and bring it up. Now the position that my hands are in is one hand is on the frame just as my hand would be on a piece of paper when I write and the other hand is on the handle and you just start you just start to draw and you can go around the outer perimeter of the monogram using a straight stitch this perforates the stick and rinse stabilizer and stick and rinse is the sticker that's on top so by doing straight stitches all the way around it will make it tear very easily after we have embroidered our, using our zigzag stitch. And so you can go around the entire bride with a straight stitch, or you can switch 
and do complete that letter by switching to your zigzag stitch now. And I'm going to do that so that you don't have to watch the entire embroidery process of bride and groom. Selecting the zigzag stitch, you want to turn the hand wheel to see is the stitch of the, is the width of the stitch, and I'm not on a zigzag, I'm on a straight stitch. I forgot. Oh, and by the way, if you have a computerized machine and you change from zigzag to straight stitch, it's very likely your machine will change the tension. So I like to use a zigzag stitch, and then if I need to tie a knot or do a, a uh, really small stitch on, on a line, like you see right here on the R, it's a straight line, and that should be a straight stitch that we use, not a zigzag. It's easier to just leave it on a zigzag stitch so that you don't have to keep changing the tension because if you don't have your, re your tension reduced and when using metallic thread, I like to go two and a half numbers less than normal. So whatever your machine is normal at, you need to open the book that came with your machine to find that out. So I'm selecting a zigzag stitch width and we turn the hand. Well, I'm sorry, I'm smiling because my dog is uh, climbing into a bucket with the bridal satin. She apparently loves the bridal satin, so I plan on making a, a dog bed out of bridal satin on, a, on an episode coming up soon. So I'll go ahead now and turn the hand wheel. And I see that that stitch is perfect for the width of this, and since you're gonna be doing the same project as I am, a three millimeter wide zigzag swing is perfect for going down the letter of the B. We'll go ahead now and the, the thing about doing embroidery is that when you're using a zigzag stitch, if you turn the hoop like that, your stitches will change. You can choose to do all of your stitches at this angle or you can choose to hold it straight but you need to choose before you begin embroidering and not change your mind later on. Now you have the sticker right here. So you can do this. You can say, okay, this is my horizon line and I'm gonna keep my, my needle in line with that position. Or you can go, I'm gonna do it at an angle and that means that this is my horizon line. And that's what you want to keep straight going left and right. And I think that that is a very pretty angle, so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that on both of the stickers so that they match. See how now the needle goes into the point of that monogram nicely? Know that I'm not pushing down with my left hand, and I'm literally writing with my right hand. I am right-handed. If you're left-handed, switch your hands. And then just go down. If you're going to go, if, you're, if you don't need to go back up on the part of the letter, then you want to make sure you go slowly all the way down. And that's what I'm going to do now. Do not push down or the hoop will jerk on the surface of the sewing machine. If you feel your machine is doing that, that uh, jerking on the surface, then then look at your hands and see, do you have white knuckles? Are you pushing down from years of pushing down? Remember, we are resting and enjoying ourselves with the octi hoops. And you see how I went all the way to the end of the B and then I came back. And now I tie my knot by reducing the width of the stitch. And sew a few stitches and then move the hoop. That gives you a very secure knot that won't come out on you later on. And go ahead now and cut the thread. And we move up to this area right here where we're going to go ahead and tie our knot. And once again, making sure that the horizon line stays in that direction so that we don't drive our car when we do monogramming. We do loops like this rather than driving the car. Now I am going to switch back to the three width because this letter is the biggest letter it will probably have the largest width compared to the other letters on the word bride and groom. So make sure you keep your hoop in the same angle or it'll look like you didn't do it right. There we go. And now I'm going 
to switch, because this is a very narrow line, to a zero width, which is the same as a straight stitch, but my tension won't suddenly change on me. And I'm going to go slow. And I, I'm going to go up and down because I want more of the metallic thread to show. You see how I can go up and down several times? And now I go ahead and switch to a two. I think a two is probably going to be a good width for these letters as they are narrower. Maybe two and a half. Yeah, let's try two and a half. If you go too wide, you're going to end up losing the space between these two. And I was wrong, so we're going to go down to a two. Two millimeters wide. Keep that space in between. And go up, up faster than you go down on the eye. And we are moving very quick now. We're going to go over here and switch to a two again. And just do a little box and then tie a knot using a narrow width again or going all the way on zero. Now the one thing we didn't do is we didn't go all the way around the R, I, D, and E with a straight stitch. So when we go to cut or remove the stick and rinse stabilizer, it may not tear away clean. So let's go ahead and we stitched through the sticker right there. And go ahead and get it started. I want to hold down on the fabric so that as you pull, you don't cause the fabric to pull off of the stick and tear beneath. And we're going to pull toward it. So I'm pushing down on the lace. Nice and clean coming off there. And let's see, do we, yeah, see how it's, it's actually causing a strain on the stitch right there. So this is why it's better. If you're not going to wash the item, because if you wash this, it, it, it has, it, it, it can't damage the thread, can it? It just rinses away and, and your thread's just laying there like nothing ever happened. But this is an item that I'm not going to wash. So I, I need to go all the way around the letters with a straight stitch so that it's cl it cuts clean as it did on the B. And when you're done, you just pull towards the middle and it all comes off. Any that remains, use a set of tweezers and pull that off and you have a beautiful monogram. Go ahead and repeat that on the groom side. Okay, done with the groom. Cut the thread. And remove the sticker. Sure comes off easy when we do that straight stitch around. Now to remove the fabric from the hoop, you simply pull towards the embroidery and you start getting a hole. And if you're careful, you go around and around like this, you can create as small a hole as possible and you can patch that hole with another piece of the stick and tear that's bigger and use this entire sheet again. Okay, time for the creative feet part of this. And we're going to begin with the satin edge foot first, but before doing that, we need to fuse the fabric in between, or fuse the double-sided batting in between the fabric. And because we've already drawn the heart, we'll know right where to cut. Cut down in the middle of this, or close to it, so we can iron it on the back side as well. Go ahead now and position, keep in mind where the lace is on the back side. So if there's, if you iron this onto this, you want to make sure that you're not missing some of the lace on the back side. So go like this and think, all right, that, that is good. Now instead of pinning, I just hold my finger like this, open it up, go like that. 
keep them together. And now we know that we have equal amount lace on the back side as we do on the front side. Double check to make sure. So I put my finger down along the stitching line and definitely I am within there and up here as well and here as well. And I'm just on the border of that so I'm not wasting any of that. Take and bring this up to the ironing board. Apply the pressing sheet over the top and press. We're going to press both the both sides of this on the this side and then flip it over and press on the other side as well. And make sure you let it cool so that it doesn't separate. And making sure you don't lift and pull it off of the batting. Ready to cut. I'm going to start cutting. And we're going to satin stitch using a wider zigzag swing than the width of that line and that stitching line. So if you don't quite cut all the black ink off, it's still not going to show through the stitch. But we'll do our best to go around. Try not to cut the stitching line that you sewed before because that's keeping the lace down and adhering it to the satin. Okay, so there I have that and you can see that a little bit's lifting up on the back. So taking some of the powder, it's like the batting didn't have enough fusing there because I definitely got it hot enough. So having a little of this around is, is handy. And take it to the iron one more time. Make sure you have your pressing cloth. So this is the satin edge foot and that wire is going to sit off the edge. And you won't be able to see it once it's off the edge. So then instead of watching the wire, you're gonna watch the front of the foot. But before trusting the wire, the first thing we're going to do is make sure that the foot is in line with the zigzag needle or with the needle position based on the width of your zigzag stitch. So I'm selecting a four millimeter wide swing on my zigzag. I'm going to do this with another piece of fabric underneath. so that I don't damage my batting. Turn the hand wheel towards you until the needle swings left. So left swing, and now, and now it's gonna swing to the right. And when it's in the right position, we lower the needle down until the eye of the needle disappears. And now the width of the needle is at its widest point. Turn the nut on the foot, which moves the wire over to the sewing machine needle. Once it's in position, you could have bent the needle by turning that nut and moving the wire over. So we do one more stitch, have it swing left, and then have it swing right again, and then bring it down carefully and make sure that you are to the side of the wire. And if you are, you're now ready to sew. Now, there may be some of you thinking, look at all that sewing she did right into the fabric. I don't want to do that, but watch. Take the foot, lift it up, pull off, pull out, and look, the stitches, the stitches all just came right out. So now before you begin, you're going to double check again just to make sure that everything is, is right. Sew so a few stitches forward. And notice my hand positioning is cradling beneath the fabric, not holding on top, but underneath. Take the foot now and lift up and pull back again. That secures that stitch. And if you don't have a, a knot stitch on your machine or you don't want to switch to a straight stitch to tie it off. So now I'm selecting my stitch length and I'm gonna kind of guess at it. Going to a six, and that's not a six millimeter, it's a .06, which is just a little tiny bit above half. I'm gonna go a little bit lower. Five, and that's point zero five. And we're going to come back around after this and sew with the curls and piping foot and the beads after. So 
And having the stitch be really, really tight is not necessary. If you want your width of your stitch to be wider, feel free to, to alter this pattern to your liking, to whatever you like. And if you don't like the stitch so close together, you don't have to do so. See how my elbows are always resting. Don't look at the sewing machine needle, watch the front of the foot. Allowing the sewing machine to do the feeding so that you don't have any puckers. The satin edge foot loves to glide over the surface of the fabric so you don't have to worry about a bunch of um, spreading or puckers. It's very relaxing watching it do this as you pretty much are not doing a whole lot of steering. Now we're coming up on the corner here and you'll see that the foot is now having a little trouble getting up on that. So this is a time when you increase your stitch length, so go one full stitch length higher and so slow because it might just pull that right up and, uh, and then you might get a space. So one, million, one full stitch length longer and it just picked it right up. Now I'm shortening it down again because it is feeding and I don't want to have spread out on my stitching. So needle up, it must be up. When working with the satin edge foot, your needle must be up in order to turn a corner, like a 90 degree corner or the point on the bottom of the heart because the wire has the stitch wrapped around it. So if you look down in here, you'll see that the stitch is actually stuck to the wire. Then you pull or push the fabric back and it drops off. Now you're able to turn. And for those of you who've never turned a corner with your needle up, it might feel a little bit tense, but it's no big deal because the wire is where your outside swing is. So you don't have to look or turn the hand wheel to check needle positions. You just make sure that your wire is in line with the edge of the fabric. And any corner, whether it's an inside corner or an outside corner, you're always going to want to increase stitch length for just a few stitches until you see that the machine is starting to take the fabric and then shorten the stitch length back down. Remember, I'm saying shorten, not narrow. If you change the width of the stitch in the middle of using this foot, your needle could hit the pin. So be careful. Make sure you're um, awake when you do this and paying attention to your initial settings. Shorten it back down and now we're good to go. And once again, elbows down, shoulders relaxed healthy sewing and relaxing here here it wasn't quite fused so I'm gonna increase the stitch length there to help it take that fabric through there we go. So that's why you don't want to look at the needle. We're gonna, I'm going to keep that length longer. Go all the way down. And now lift the foot, pull off the wire, and go back. And go back over that area again. This will now fill in and make this entire area stronger. And now once I get there, shorten the stitch length back down again. I've reached a corner now, so now I gotta do what? Leave the needle up, lift the presser foot, push off the wire and turn. Place the foot so it sits off the edge and now increase stitch length once again, one number longer than normal and the machine will help you do a beautiful mitered corner without any effort. Shorten your stitch length back down again. And we're coming up on the pearls and piping foot, which is a, another wonderful uh, foot to use for putting beads on and chain and wire and zippers and cording. Now, it's starting to not feed, and, and I'm not sure why, but it doesn't matter. All I have to do is what? Increase stitch length. It may have something to do with the lace on the bottom. I don't know, but we're going to find out when I'm done sewing. Shorten stitch length back down again. 
And then we're coming up on the end, and uh, the common thing for people to want to do is stop right there. But we're not going to do that. We're going to go in to the stitch, and cross over where we were, and doing so by increasing stitch length. Lift the foot up, pull off the wire, go back, go back on it again. For those of you who don't have a, the ability to uh, use a knot stitch, or you can shorten down to a straight stitch. Just make sure that the wire is not in line with the needle, and so a few straight stitches. Another added beautiful technique to do is to use a straight stitch and move the wire over so that your straight stitch is right alongside of the, the satin stitch that you did. We're going to increase stitch length because the, the thickness of the fabric, whenever it's really thick, you can use a longer stitch length to help it pull forward. That way you won't end up with too many, too short a stitch length, and I'm adjusting and finding that, uh, let's see, 2.0 is a normal stitch length, and it's feeling really nice. I am not sitting like this trying to watch and make sure that stitch stays right along next to it, because the foot does the guiding for me. Here I'm using a straight stitch, not even a zigzag anymore, and it adds this incredible professional look to it. Lift and turn. Remember, you can't lose your needle position because your needle position is where the wire is. And the wire is always off the edge of the fabric. Very light touching of the fabric so your hands don't get sore. Can't wait till you see this up close. It's beautiful. Sewing becomes so easy. You can go really fast if you want, but you don't have to. You can go as slow as feels comfortable for you. where I left off, now I'm going to go ahead and reverse stitch. And we're ready to cut the thread and change to the curls and piping foot. First I want you to really get a look at just how pretty that stitch is with that straight stitch right along the edge of it. Isn't that gorgeous? Alright, curls and piping is next. And uh, I have a snap-on adapter on my machine, so I just push to release the foot. If you don't, we do give you adapters in the pearls and piping and sequins and ribbon and satin edge foot package so that it will fit on every sewing machine that has a zigzag stitch. There we go. Take and place this underneath, and I'm going to alternate it. Now, we started the satin edge on this side of the heart, and then I'm going to start pearls and piping on this side. And let's check the back. And on the back, there is no missed stitching. The lace is all perfect and laying nice and flat. Go ahead and cut your start tails on your thread so you have nothing to distract you as you switch to the pearls and piping foot. And I gotta do a bobbin check. Not bad. Now these beads are big, but it's no trouble for the pearls and piping foot. You just slide it underneath, lower the foot, select a zigzag stitch according to the instructions. I tell you how wide the zigzag should be, how wide the zigzag stitch should be based on how wide the beads are. So if the bead is a four millimeter bead, you're gonna go at least five millimeters on your zigzag stitch width. And then turn the hand wheel and see, does the needle clear the bead in both swings of the zigzag stitch? This machine has a really neat feature. It has the ability to shift the needle position on a zigzag stitch. It's a really neat feature that, uh, well, I just am enjoying it very much. I'm going to go wider, though, on the width. Let's see if I can go all the way to a 6 millimeter wide swing, just to give it a little bit more of a uh, bite on the thickness of this batting. And then, see my hands again? I am not the reason my fingers are not touching. I'm not the reason the beads stay. All I have to do is guide the fabric. And once again, don't look at the needle, but we have to secure the beginning of the bead, don't we? So I did a few stitches, now I just lift and pull back again. Go back to the first bead and start again. And then I hop back and do it again. Especially if I'm putting it on a garment. I'm going to do a whole bunch of stitches, not a whole bunch, maybe four, 
forwards and backs on your zigzag to keep that bead from falling off or becoming separated from the fabric at some point. So all the way down to the corner, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to lift and hop it back, do a couple stitches, and see how I go slow. No need to rush. Notice that I'm not guiding. See, my hands are free from having to do any of the hard labor. And now we just lift and turn. And this is when I do a technique called walking. And you just turn the hand wheel by hand. One stitch is left and right swing of the zigzag stitch. And then you lift and hop it back again. We do this and we get a much nicer corner for the bead. Think about how thick those beads are and they really need a little help to uh, turn that 90 degree corner or whatever corner angle you're turning. Turn around. This foot is made out of a material that glides over the surface of the fabric so you don't have to worry about it puckering. Isn't this turning out beautiful? Do the walking again on the inside corner and you might need to push down with your finger like that. And once again, do the walking, turn the hand wheel. Don't use the foot pedal. Whenever you feel nervous, use your hand wheel instead. And always turn the hand wheel toward you. So now you can see I, I've walked it and it's still not feeding. And that's because right here, you can see the bead is in the way. It's like a wall in front of the foot. So we're gonna go ahead and lift it up and walk it one bead and then turn the hand wheel again. It's hard to imagine you can turn such, a, such an angle with such a large bead, but you can see I'm doing it right in front of you, how easy it is. Notice my hand positioning once again. I have not touched those beads while sewing around this design, and neither will you have to do that either. So I'm, I'm approaching where the beads are going to intersect or meet with one another, and there it's, it's very common for there to be a slight gap, and, uh, but when you, when you look at something, you usually look at it as a whole. And the only person that sees the flaw is the person that made it. So remember that. It's just like you probably didn't see the mole on my face all this time, but I have one, and I'm aware of it because it's on my face. So we'll go ahead and go all the way down. And we're approaching the bead, and the bead at the beginning is starting to started to fold back. You need to be careful because you could break a needle if you're not. So we turn once again and do the walking. And you want to walk it as far as you possibly can to see if you can get away with not having a gap between the beads. You can see now I've all, I got two rows going under there. Hard to believe that the tunnel on this foot can let more than one row of bead in there. You'd be shocked. Go ahead and we're going to go back and walk it back. We're about ready to cut the bead and call this project finished. Straight stitch now for extra securing. Take it off. And now is choosing which bead to cut. So you can see that there's not enough room for both beads. One of them's got to go. Which one is going to go? The one that's sticking out farthest. But this is when you want to wear your glasses so you don't cut the thread that you use to sew it to it. And off goes that bead. You might need to remove one more. Let's see. And that's a judgment call on, on your end. Would you rather see a little bit of a space or have it stick out a little bit? It's really hard to see. It's right there. In this case, I'm going to kind of stretch it a little bit and see if that bead doesn't pop right into place. Just a little tail on the end of that bead, snip it off. So for me, I think it's, it's less noticeable to have them stacking a little tiny bit right here than it would be to have a gap. There you have two champagne coasters. And what a special wedding present um, that you can give. And, um, and you're not only giving a present, but you're, you're adding a photo op for that wedding. 
um, enjoy this and I look forward to giving you more bridal techniques in the future.